power of for young players where they talk so much about boxing off, block off the board, and it cost a lot because the blockout was tremendous. In the first half, the Alabama front line scored 23 points to just 22 back in front. Connor penetrates and hits. That's the Connor we know. Penetration can make it happen, but so often he dishes off, but he didn't that time. Connor with four points. Alabama draws first blood in the second half, and the Crimson Tide lead is four. Second period of play. James Blackman shut out so far tonight. Dishes off to Davender. Now I'm a little like Billy Reed. They needed to get it in the hands of. Uh, Got it in the hands of James Blackman, who hits his first bucket of the night, and it's a three-pointer. That pulls Kentucky within three, 35-32. He has a tendency to be a little bit of a street shooter, so he can get hot. He can bring him to life. Farmer guarded closely by Blackman. Got a pick from McKee. Pick and roll. McKee converts. And it's just a beautiful pass. That's the oldest play in the book. Oldest play in the book. He picked, and then the thing he did so beautifully that made it happen, he just rolled straight back toward the basket. And when the offensive player for Bama saw that there was two players on him, he knew he had to do it. Chapman for three. And he got it over Blackwood. Didn't hesitate, and that's what he's been doing, and that's what the Alabama coaching staff has been concerned about. He's been hesitating on his shot. He just penetrated and just stuck it in. Alabama by four. Chapman off the dribble. That one won't go. Ainsley batted it up and it's taken by Connor. Connor turned it over. He lost control of the Joe, and it went up about his head. And the fast break was going, but Alabama will turn it over as Eddie Sutton directs traffic. A little advice for Richard Madison. Because they had three on two and they had the ball in the hands of Terry Connor in the middle. 39 35 Bama so far in the three point department. Alabama two of four, Kentucky only four of 11. Farmer saves it, great defensive play, and Connor has it for Bama. Kentucky just seemed to go to sleep. Ainsley in traffic. Oh, he scores! Our basketball. Locked it clean deep. He saw he didn't have it. Came back and just power moved it against Locke. Bama back up by six. Mark Godfrey against Chapman. Connor against Davender. Blackman, another three. That went off the mark. There is Ainsley to pull it down for Bama, and the Crimson Tide a chance to take its biggest lead. Lob for McKee. Came down, went back up, put it in. Lock did not get back on defense quick enough. He just was outran by Derrick McKee, who has excellent court speed. Biggest lead in the game for Alabama, 43-35. Eight-point margin. Derrick McKee with 19 points out of Meridian, Mississippi. Long post, Madison, 12-footer in there. Posted up beautiful. Good turnaround jumper. And scored Kentucky's first six points of the game, but held in check since that time. That's number eight. Farmer. Good position by Madison, but clear the rebound. The out of the Chapman. He gives it to Davender. Nothing there. They'll set it up. Madison. Got his own rebound.
start of the first half, returning to the Kentucky lineup. Men are off the bench for 12 points to lead the Wildcats in the first half of play. And James Blackman goes to the bench. Jim Farmer seems to have some cramps in his legs, and they're working on him at the tail end there of the Alabama bench. He was replaced by Keith Askins, the 6'6 freshman, number 41. Madison, two of three tonight at the free throw line. Can't figure out the free throw shooting of this team. They're better than that. Madison's been averaging 12 and a half rebounds per game the last four games. He has six already tonight. Here's Madison. He got the second one. So we've got a timeout with 15, 19 remaining in the game. Here's what Kentucky has been unable to stop. Derek McKee inside. Bama up 43-38. Alabama's Derek McKee to be the tie. He has 19 points. And you talk about a complete player, Joe. He ranks in the top 10 in the SEC in scoring, rebounding, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, blocks, and steals. Steals, that's amazing. It is. He's fourth in the league in steals. He has great quickness from in that size. And as we mentioned earlier, he played on the World Championship United States team in Spain this past summer. And you see the bench by Kentucky, they lead 12 to 1 in bench scoring. But he won the gold medal. There's an Alabama turnover. Connor sailed it out of bounds. Jim Farmer back in for the tie. And Askins gets a little word from Wimp Sanderson. Askins, just a freshman, didn't respond just exactly like Coach Wimp Sanderson wanted him to. Gators and Gators. Another final from the ACC. Clemson, a winner over NC State. Clemson, I believe, is unbeaten. That's 11 and 0. Chucky with the ball. Chapman has him knocked away by Gottfried, and Gottfried got him on the arm. Third foul on Mark Gottfried. He's the first Bama player in foul trouble. And poor delusion because he is an excellent defender, and he's done an excellent job tonight against Rex Chapman. The excellent three-point shooter for the Kentucky Wildcats. Back against Auburn the other night, he was six of nine, Chapman, for 24 points. Irv Thomas into the game for the Wildcats. Davener open, but didn't take the shot. Alabama with a five-point lead. their now. They definitely play a perimeter game. No question about that. Davender back to Thomas, off the glass, no good. Farmer clears the rebound. Got to hit those. Shot he was looking for. Penetration, defense went to him. Man wide open, he just couldn't get it to go. Just over 14 minutes to play in the game. Farmer pulls up, jumper is good. Jim Farmer now for six points against that 16 for game average. And the Alabama lead goes to seven. One shy of their biggest advantage of the contest. Kentucky just 33% here in the second half. Davender got open, dished to Madison and laid it in. Yeah, just shows you what penetration does. You can see the defense go to him, and there's a man wide open underneath. Good pass. Kentucky pulls within five. And a 1-4 offensive set against man-to-man -man defense by Kentucky. Connor McKee, another one for Derek McKee. He has 21. Well, young guards watching, he just penetrates, penetrates. And you got to come to the ball. You got to stop the pressure of the ball. Kentucky did a good job of shutting Connor down, but he saw the man wide open. Chapman's three is short on the floor, picked up by Bama. Give Godfrey the credit, Tom. He got the hand in his face to make the shot not a good one. Godfrey for three. Rebounded by Davender. Connor bumps him. That'll be foul number three on Terry Connor. Two key players now in this Bama lineup. Connor and Gottfried with three fouls each. Gottfried goes out of the game, replaced by James Jackson. And for Kentucky, Cedric Jenkins is in. And Herb Thomas takes the seat on the Wildcat bench. And does have the luxury of rotating those three guards. J.J., Gottfried, Connor. The Commodores with a four-point lead at halftime. Jenkins just does not look comfortable out there. Davender shuffled his feet. Traveling call. Kentucky turns it over. He mentioned that the first half time when you're talking. He's still just he's guilty. He, when he comes down, he wants to take the pressure off of that foot. And he didn't heal as quick as they thought he would. Kentucky has waiting in the wings. Mike Scott, the 6'11 transfer from Wake Forest. Healthy and get 
get Scott in the lineup. It'll make a big difference to their inside game. Jinxon's inside well. Much to the read. They could be tough. Jenkins that time was able to stop McKee as McKee went outside. Connor goes up and is fouled by Davender. And Davender number two. The second team foul on the Wildcats. James Blackman in for Kentucky. And Chapman goes up. Also waiting in the wings for Kentucky is uh, what most people think is the finest recruiting year in the country. They've signed five players and they're supposed to be some of the great talent in America. Andrews, also for Davender in the Kentucky lineup. This Alabama team has silenced the big 23,000 plus crowd, taking the crowd out of the game. It wasn't a lead and they held it and that'll keep the crowd out. And it's never trailed. Farmer from three. It's good. Jim Farmer with his ninth point. Seven on this half already. And a ten point family. That's the biggest. Farmer's starting to kind of heat up just a little bit. He's pouring better. He's taking better shots. Jenkins takes a pass off his leg and gives it up to Andrew. Chucky very thin with all those injuries. Miller from three missed everything. Air ball and a foul on Madison as he tried to pull it down. Again, you could see the block out on the weak side away from that ball over there. Derek McKee got Madison trapped even over his back. Good call. So we'll take a timeout with 11.52 to play in the game from Rupp Arena. And Kentucky's in trouble. They trail by 10. Pretend my finger is your car's fuel injector. It sprays gas into your cylinder. And with your piston, it creates this explosion. But fuel... But, uh, we understand uh, talking to Wilt Sanderson, his former assistant today, that CM is uh, doing better. In fact, uh, I talked to him on the phone, Tom, in the middle of the week, and really didn't know what was wrong with him. There wasn't a lot of tests. He was in a lot of pain. And we're just thrilled to death that he's okay and he's out of the hospital. He missed the game the other night against Tennessee. And, of course, they lost at home. And they had been playing very well, as you had mentioned earlier. One of the fine gentlemen of college basketball, C.M. Newton. And all of us want to send him get well wishes and hope to see him a week from tonight when we'll have Vanderbilt on TV against Georgia in Athens. Gottfried and Connor, three fouls apiece for Bama. Locke, the only man in foul trouble for the Wildcats. Alabama out rebounding Kentucky now, 20 to 15. Slowly but surely, the Tide taking command of the game. Here's a good defensive play by Kentucky as Richard Madison backs the ball out of bounds. He dove in the air to get a piece of it, and of course the crowd loved the hustle. They know the game here, and they know when you're giving it everything you have. Kentucky's owning the inbound pass. 27 seconds on the shot clock for Bama. Jackson on the point now with Connor out of the game. Craig Dudley is in for the Crimson Tide. It's Ford Jr. from Gadsden, averaging four games. Dudley wears number 24. can afford to be patient now. A three by Farmer won't go. Tap no good, and Miller takes it for Kentucky. They had a good shot. They had a great tap. They tapped it to the glass. I think it had been in business. They milked the shot clock, but couldn't get it down. Alabama still man-to-man -man defensively. Approaching the midway point of the second half, and Kentucky with the ball down 10. Thought they would zone more in this game, but they've stayed pretty much with their man defense. It's worked very well for them. This has sort of been an inconsistent Kentucky team. Blew Louisville out by over 30, then lost to Georgia. Beat Auburn on the Tigers' home court, and now trailing Alabama by 10 at home. Miller fakes, fires, off the glass for two. Beautiful soft shot. Tom, that's because they've been living and dying with that perimeter shooting, and you're going to have those nights when you're not doing it. And that's why what you mentioned was so important. When they get the back, this will be a very key thing for this team. Crowd now tries to pick Kentucky up. They lob to McKee. Collision with Madison. Richard Madison calls for his third foul. And of course, no, no foul on this Kentucky team. Right now, this Kentucky team just, just does not have a lot of real solid inside play. Madison still moving as he hit McKee to call the proper one. And Alabama will put it in play as Chapman returns to the lineup. Eight. Bob McKee stuck. 
And they were zoning. They picked it up very quickly. And he just got on the back side of the zone and the pass right there. Terry Turner. Absolutely perfect. Quickly on the other end. Chapman short on his shot. Connor with a rebound. He just sees the whole court. He knows where everybody is. He makes very few mistakes. Does not turn it over much. And it's exactly what you want a part point guard to be. Farmer, he's been hot in the second half. He has 11, 9 of those in this second period. He's playing so much better, no question about it. Mainly because he's taking better percentage shots. Well, can, uh, uh, Alabama leads. He has 12 points. Madison spinning move of beauty. Richard Madison with 13 points. He and Miller have carried the show offensively. They've combined for 27. Connor against Chapman. Dishes it back to McKee. Missed that one, but got his own rebound. Still loose, and Chapman pulls it down for Kentucky. Wildcat fast breaker, three on two. Lob to Blackman for the stop. Beautiful pass by Chapman. Chapman with a little magic of his own. Look at that beautiful pass right there. And number 10, James Blackman, just about 6'3", but what a leaper. Kentucky's back in it. They fired up the crowd. It's an 8-point Alabama lead. 8.40 on the clock. Farmer. Ball away jumper will count, and he's fouled. The biggest play of the game so far. He just stayed with it, would not be denied. Big game for him because we've mentioned he hasn't been feeling well, he hasn't been playing well, but he's come to life here in the second half. As I mentioned when we came on, he's the heart and soul of this team. When he goes, this team is difficult to beat. Look at it again. Good pressure defensively. Was able to fall away and hit it and draw the foul from Derek Miller. Miller's first, five against Kentucky. Farmer converts the three-point trip. He has 14 points in the game, and all but two of those this half. And the lead goes back to 57-46. Kentucky offensively has not had the real good spacing either. They've been crowded up a lot. Coach Sutton, you can see, has been saying, spread it out, spread it out. Madison with an outside shot. Richard Madison having one of his best offensive nights. He averages seven a game. He has 15 this evening. 57-48, Kentucky back within nine. 7.50 on the clock. Offensive foul will turn it over to Kentucky. Jackson called for number one. Oh, that defense just completely collapsed against the pressure of that ball. And it went to that ball. He ran over somebody inside. Whip Sanderson with a grimace in front of the Alabama bench, but his crimson tide in from Georgia, the Vanderbilt Commodores against the Georgia Bulldogs as we continue with top SEC action all season long. Well, Rex Chapman leads the team in scoring, but he also leads in assists, and here's a reason why. He also shows you why this crowd gets so fired up when he touches the ball. Joey's the son of a coach, and it, it's, right. uh, he's grown up doing it, hasn't he? It's just amazing how those young men always have a keen sense of basketball. It's almost like a sixth sense. Well, they hand it to them when they're uh, one, and when they start walking and say, play, and there's a great shot of him right there. Wayne Chapman, his dad, the coach at Kentucky Wesleyan College. Lock on the out-of-bounds play, streaks in for the layup. Kentucky went to sleep. I mean, Alabama did. They didn't get back defensively properly, and it cost them. Big basket. 57-50 Alabama. And it was just a simple run out. It wasn't anything fancy at all. Alabama's looking for patience. They want to get it inside, and they want Terry Connor to handle it. Davener fights through a screen, still with Connor. They double-team him, Connor shoots and hits. What a play! Great pivoting, and that's really what did it. Didn't walk, just kept pivoting. The defense couldn't stay with him. Just a little short five-footer. 59-50, the Alabama lead back to nine points. I think Coach Sutton thought he walked, but I thought he kept his pivot foot. 6.55 on the clock. Alabama hoping to stay unbeaten in the SEC. They're 2-0. Kentucky 1-1 one and, one and could ill afford another home court loss. Madison, too hard. Lock fighting. It comes down to Farmer. 
Ainsley. He's the one who kicked it out and really kept Locke from just getting a simple put back in. And that's what you have to do when you can't gain control. This from Kentucky appeared to be on a roll. Alabama once again assumes command. McKee away from Locke. Missed it. Locke clears the rebound and is knocked out of bounds by Michael Ainsley. Chapman back in for the Kentucky Wildcats. Miller went out. You see there, 17.8 a game, only nine tonight. They've done a good job on him. John McGill Jr., who also is a columnist for the Lexington Herald leader, like Billy Reeves, said when Eddie Sutton draws his plays, he draws Rex's and O's, not X's and O's. I can see why. He's going to be a great one. 59-50, Kentucky tried to cut into a nine-point lead. Davender will try a three. Missed everything. Locke has it. Bangs his way to the basket, pounds it home, and is fouled. Beautiful power move. Got the long rebound. It went all the way across. Davin to a three-point shot. It doesn't go. It goes all the way across. He just fights and watch him come back to it. Beautiful power move to the basket. He took it right to Derek McKinnon. That time took it to the to the big guys inside for Alabama. He's got a chance at a three-point play, and he's put Kentucky right back in it. The foul assessed to Ainsley, his third. He is the third Bama starter in foul trouble. Ainsley, Connor, and Gottfried with three apiece. Locke converts the free throw. He has six for the game. And the three-point play pulls Kentucky within six points. It's 59-53 Alabama with 5.45 to play. Sutton wants to push the defense further out. Pick up Connor further out. Don't let him penetrate so far. Davender strips the ball away and saves it. Out of bounds to Bama. Great defense by Davender. Really a tough break. He didn't get the ball back. He stripped Connor. Herb Thomas is in for Kentucky. There's Thomas, number 30. The Rob Locke goes out to, to a hand from the crowd. Locke was booed earlier by this Kentucky crowd earlier in the season. Not tonight. The ball was taken out underneath because it didn't touch anybody. Farmer shot no good. Davender cradles the rebound. Wildcats a chance to cut it to four. This is a big possession what? by Kentucky. They need a real good percentage shot on this offensive set. They get plenty of time. Chapman backs it out. Approaching the five-minute mark. Nothing inside. Davender's open. Tap no good. Madison had it for a moment, and Jackson comes out with it for Bama. They had a couple of shots at it, but couldn't score. Amber was wide open and didn't realize it. McKee collides with Madison, and Madison called for his fourth personal foul. They're trying to give him weak side help and set up to take the charge. But it hasn't worked. Close call, and, and the camera really didn't come over in time to see for sure, but I believe he might have been still moving as the collision occurred. Terry Connor again, though. He made two players come to him and just tipped the lob pass to the big guy, Derek McKee. 16 foul against Kentucky, and that's key because from this point on, Alabama will be at the line shooting one and one. Bama's just com committed five so far. The key is 11 of 15 in the game with eight rebounds. He has 23 points. Miller for Blackman in the Kentucky lineup. Madison stays in with four fouls. Farmer open. Madison picks him up and can't afford to foul him. What do they call? They call Farmer for the charge. Look at Wim Sanderson. No basket either. Judge it. That's why this is the toughest game in the world to officiate. He may have been playing it. Couldn't see that time. He, he, he may have been playing it. It was very, very close either way. Maybe it was an even up call after the other one against Madison. In any event, they cancel each other out, and Kentucky has the ball down by six. Locke can't handle it. He was pushed from behind. That 
Hawks have one on one now because that last foul, the charge by Farmer, was the sixth foul, team foul against Alabama. So Kentucky will go to the line and shoot one and one and a chance to get the four. Also the fourth personal foul on Michael Ansley. 422 though. He's got to stay with him now. He can't be jerking him out of the lineup. Bob Locke will shoot one plus one. He has hit two of four at the free throw line. That one a brick off the back of the rim. Ainsley rebound. Well, that hurt. Big one and one for Kentucky. He's only shooting 50%. As we repeat again, Kentucky last in the Southeastern Conference at the free throw line at just under 59% as a team, and it's going to cost you. Six-point Bama lead with four minutes to play. Whistle underneath and a foul on Kentucky. I believe on Chapman. Be number one on Chapman. That's who it's against. Senior with great leaping ability. He has a 39-inch vertical leap. You don't think of a guard being able to, to get up there and jump for the big boys, but he can do it. There's Earl Thomas taking his spot on the foul line. As Rob Lark retreats to the bench. Barry Connor shoots 83% at the foul line, and he has 10 assists so far in this game. He has played a tremendous contest. Alabama guards have led the SEC in assists for four straight years as Connor misses. Tapped around a couple of times, it comes down to Chapman. Big miss for Alabama. They could have raised that lead to eight, and they're shooting 77% on the season. Miller. I don't think it'll count. There was a whistle. No, it will not count. There was a whistle before he got the shot underway. We're going to shoot it at the Alabama end. Basket no good. They called an illegal pick on Rex Chapman. I didn't see it, Joe. I didn't need it, but I saw a player, a player sprawling on the floor. I was trying to pick up what was happening there on the weak side, the way that the Kentucky people, uh, offense was spreading out and who was coming into the middle. And on the far side, I don't know if we can pick it up or not. Let's look at it right here. Right there, there was Chapman against Jim Farmer. It wasn't Chapman, it was Eric Thomas. Eric Thomas, I'm sorry. It was Eric Thomas? Yes. So Thomas gets his first one. The key to that, Tom, is that he can move it all when you set that pick, they're going to call it. And it looks like he was moving, and it's just automatic with the official. Farmer hits two free throws. And a big turnaround there because Miller had hit the shot. Instead, we go to the Alabama free throw line where Farmer converts two. We take a timeout with an eight-point Bama lead. And that's the hotel they built to help bring the final four to Lexington, Kentucky. The Webs love their basketball. At the foul line tonight, Kentucky's 11 of 16. Um, Alabama's 4 of 6. Ed Davenor walks the ball up court for the Wildcats. You trail by eight. And the clock ticks down for the three and a half minute mark. Bama shooting 62% the second half. Miller dishes to Chapman, turnaround jumper. A good, rebounded by Angelou. I don't think it was just the greatest shot in the world, and I think Eddie Sutton, at this point in the game, he's got to get better shots than that, and they've got to start maybe now looking at the three-point line. Chapman held to only nine points tonight. About half his average. On the other hand, Bain Pam is looking for patience, and they want to go inside. Leonard Anderson, three-point shots, really, at this point. He would like to work the clock. Farmer, they left him wide open and he banked it home. Love what he did there. He got loose. He knew he was. He was hanging, but he just jammed it on the glass. And that's what you have to do in a situation like that. That's a senior player for you. And he's back to 10. Maybe he took a get well pill at halftime. He has 18 oh. points and 16 this half. He's come to life. Miller for three. Rebound by McKee. Bama with a 10-point lead in the basketball. Kentucky's got to start picking up. they got to go full court and make it a war now. they got to go all out. Take the chances. I like their shot, though, but it's for three points. That's how they're going to cut the lead if they're going to get back in it. Two and a half minutes left. Kentucky lost an exhibition game here to Yugoslavia, but almost got back in it with three-point shots. And I think from that point, when Jetty Sutton realized the potential of the three and started really putting in some plays and concentrating on the three-point shots. Here's it. Jim Farmer has been on fire in this second half. He's going against the freshman, Derek Miller, and he just kind of went to school on him. He gave him a lot of action, head and shoulder fake, showed him the ball, and finally just one bounce to the right, and he got a wide-open 15-footer. Just a great move. 
Three-pointer by Davender won't go. And Gottfried has the rebound. And people heading for the exits at Rupp Arena. Alabama has never trailed. They have controlled the game start to finish. And they have been very, very impressive here tonight. Against the Kentucky team that knocked off Auburn in Auburn, Alabama, Saturday night. Auburn then the fifth-ranked team in the nation. Collision and a foul, and a will be called on Alabama. Apparently, Perry Connor. I think on the penetration they called him for charging underneath. Connor has number four. The stars of this Alabama team tonight. Derek McKee, of course, been so dynamic. Terry Connor with 10 or 11 assists already, but what a second half by Jim Farmer. 18 points in the second half for Farmer in 20 for the game. Blackman in for Kentucky. Connor picked up his fourth. They have any chance at all, Kentucky must make every free throw. Each one and ones and some three point baskets on every possession. Because Bama wants to run the clock down. For the second time in a row, Locke misses the first of a one plus one. Alabama controls the ball and the game. Harry Connor really had the numbers, but he said, I'll back it out and move this power in a little I like what he did. A lot of boys on this Alabama team. A lot of veterans on this team. There's McKee way up for the 10 second line handling the ball. Kentucky trying to trap and get a steal. Less than a minute to play. Alabama in control, leading by 12. They have certainly quieted this crowd, and this will be Eddie Sutton's first loss in referee. Derek McKee puts an exclamation point on it for this 25th point of the night. Chapman for three. It's been the story of the Kentucky Eagles. Lock inside, posts up, gets the basket, and draws the foul. Ainsley will foul out of the game with 30 seconds left. Leaves the game with 10 points, does the sophomore from Birmingham. Tremendous effort by him, though. He had to work against a, a bigger player most of the night in Robert Lock. He boarded very well, and he's a sophomore, and he's the young man who basically has replaced Buck Johnson, who's in the pros for Alabama, and he's saying we're number one. He had seven rebounds in the game. Lock rattles out on him. That's three in a row. He's missed at the free throw line. One and one. Wim Sanderson earlier today was trying to downplay the importance of this game. He said you can't set your whole season on this one game. But this is going to be a very big road victory for the Crimson Tide. As you said, Tom, when we came on, this is they're two and zero in the league, and he has made the statement before the season started that Eddie Sutton wouldn't lose in Rupp Arena. Well. He's lost tonight, and as you mentioned, Georgia basically was a home loss. So they're really 0-2 at home in the Southeastern Conference. That loss was up at Freedom Hall in Louisville, but it was a Kentucky home game, so they've won one on the road and lost two at home. Farmer with another free throw. He's perfect in four attempts at the line tonight. This has been a good team victory for the Crimson Tide. A lot of heroes. This young man has really come back. Jim Farmer. 69-55, biggest lead of the game comes at the 15-second mark. Miller gets it to Blackman, who tries from three. Tap no good, rebounded by Connor. Just five seconds left. You can hear a pin drop in the rough arena. Farmer walks, and he made it anyway. He can't miss. Two seconds left. Just about done, just about done. Celebration underway on the Alabama bench as Chapman fires from midcourt as the horn sounds. <laughs> Alabama never trailed in the game. They took command in the first half, leading by as many as six. They were up only two at the intermission, but controlled things in the second half to salt away a 69-55 important road victory in South Conference play. We'll be back to Rupp Arena for some final comments. Okay. Military group. Now, here we see a video of the tr group in training. Prosecutors say they plotted to steal missiles, explosives, and rifles from an army depot. They allegedly plotted to kill an anti-client lawyer. A federal prosecutor says that wasn't the only plan. Uh, plans to harass blacks and Jews, uh, as well as to, to rob 
uh, various establishments in order to obtain funds. Federal officials are still trying to find one of the five men they indicted. The other four were arrested last night. A report tonight suggests President Reagan did authorize an arms for hostage swap with Iran. NBC News says that is the conclusion of a secret Senate Intelligence Committee report. It says the Senate report concludes that the president did approve the arms sales and that he did it to get the American hostages out of Lebanon. But the report concludes President Reagan did not know about the diversion of profits to the Contra rebels. Meanwhile, Congress is stepping up its investigation into the whole matter. The head of the Watergate-style committee in the Senate says he may send investigators to several countries. And they would include Israel, Switzerland, maybe even Iran. President Reagan is expected to need about six weeks before getting back to a full work schedule. He returned to the White House today after four days in the hospital for prostate surgery. A few hundred White House employees and friends were waiting to welcome him back. His doctors say the president is making an excellent recovery, but he plans to wait until next week to return to his office. Then he'll gradually build up to the workload. When asked if he plans to go horseback riding again soon, he said, well, pretty soon. It's got to get a little warmer. Researchers say the recent survey of American men indicates that there is more sexual deviance out there than previously thought. More than half the men questioned said they might rape a woman if they thought they could get away with it. In another survey, 10% admitted that they had actually sexually abused children. Results of the two surveys were released in New York Thursday at a conference on sexually aggressive behavior. Panel members estimate that only 1 to 4% of child molesters are ever caught, and that only 1 in 5 rapes are ever reported. Federal health officials are starting a program to test hospital blood samples for the AIDS virus. Since the samples will be anonymous, there is no way to tell the patient if they test positive. Now that bothers some critics who say an individual has the right to know the results of the test. But officials at the National Center for Disease Control say it would be wrong to test identified blood samples without a patient's permission. And they say this is the most accurate and least obtrusive way to get a national reading on AIDS. The program is planned to continue for two years. The spread of AIDS in England is not as drastic as it is in the United States, but 300 people have died of the disease thus far in England. The British also lag behind in publishing information on the AIDS virus, but the government now has decided to remedy that. CNN's John Donvan with this report. There is now a danger. This is how the Thatcher government will be using television to warn about AIDS. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. The TV campaign's frightening images serve mostly to advertise the leaflet that viewers were referred to, which spells out in 17 pages how AIDS is spread and how the risk can be reduced. The government is printing millions of copies. The details they contain about AIDS, such as which sexual acts are most risky, are far more explicit than anything else that's been publicized here in newspaper ads or on TV. And come Monday, every household in Britain will receive one of these through the mail slot. But it will arrive in an envelope that contains a warning on the outside. The warning says, quote, This leaflet deals with matters of health and sex that may be disturbing. Thus it seems the government is anticipating squeamishness on the part of some people about having AIDS discussed in public. The Thatcher government itself was often accused of being too squeamish or uncaring about AIDS to do much about the problem. But more recently, the Prime Minister began listing AIDS as a priority. We set in hand an exchange of information about the new scourge of AIDS. Still, some AIDS education groups feel that the new TV campaign could be more bluntly informative. What the government seems to be doing is advertising the final stages of the illness rather than informing people how to keep themselves from becoming infected. In the last several months, the government spent nearly $12 million producing a TV campaign and printed items promoting AIDS education. The TV spot, however, will run only in the later evening hours. While this similar film, made as a short for movie theaters, has already earned itself a PG rating from Britain's Board of Film Censors. John Donvan, CNN, London. When Newsnight returns, the stock market soars to the 2,000 mark. And will Galveston, Texas become a gambling mecca of the Southwest? We'll have details shortly. I need some very quick money. I mean, I need it now. I am desperate to turn this around. Would you help extend my life?
Coffee should please all the senses. To the eye, it should appear rich, not thin. The aroma should capture the taste, intense, as in this dark roasted Nescafe Brava, smooth, subtle, as in this Nescafe Silka. And the taste, ah, that's why only Nescafe custom blends four distinctive coffees. Ultimately, taste is in the eye, nose, and palate of the beholder. Nescafe, taste your way. She acts, she talks, she's Oprah Winfrey, and now she walks off the pages of this week's People. People celebrates people. Oprah's made the world her stage, and people let you in on why this talk star gets everyone's ear. Then discover why wild rocker Billy Idol is just a teddy bear in leather. Next, meet Little Shop of Horror's Ellen Green off screen, the movie's sexiest plant lady. And so much more. Week after week, People celebrates people. This week, TV's best talker talks it up. Now, brilliant nail colors for today's new fashions. Leave press-on nails in 18 deep, rich, dimensional colors. Cotton candy. Sample. Opal mist. Mysterious. Leave press-on nails. 18 great nail colors to just press on with undreamed-of ease. Desert mold. Love Fiesta. Lively. Sugar plum. Lush. 40 Lee adhesive tabs and 20 Lee press-on nails for a perfect fit. Leave press-on nails. 18 sensational fashion colors. Press on. If you catch a newsworthy story on your home video camera, call CNN at 1-800-544-NEWS and be a CNN news hound. The grim task of burying the wreckage of the space shuttle Challenger got underway Thursday. NASA is storing the debris in abandoned missile silos and underground buildings at Cape Canaveral. The storage operation is expected to take at least two months, after which the compartments will be sealed by concrete slabs. Larger pieces of the Challenger wreckage will be cut down to fit into the silos. NASA promises no evidence will be destroyed in the cutting down process, but an attorney representing the surviving relatives of two Challenger astronauts called the burial premature and says NASA is destroying evidence. 23 people were injured Thursday when a car plowed through a wall of a crowded motor vehicles office in Chula Vista, California. 17 people were hospitalized, including one woman who was listed in critical condition. Authorities say the driver of the car suffered a stroke and stepped on the accelerator, sending the car crashing through the wall. The 64-year-old man was hospitalized, said to be in serious condition. Police indicate, though, they'll not press charges against him. As many as 200 people were waiting in line in the office at the time of the accident. Three Canadian firemen were hurt following an explosion at a paint plant north of Montreal on Thursday. Firefighters had battled a blaze at the site for two hours, thinking the situation was under control when the explosion occurred. The three firemen inside the plant during the blast suffered from minor burns and smoke inhalation. Conservative activists are focusing on the person they want to run for president in 1988. He's White House Communications Director Patrick Buchanan. Buchanan has become a hero to the political right because of his outspoken defense of President Reagan since the Iran arms affair broke. He's been quoted as saying he is intrigued with the idea of seeking the Republican nomination. But Senator Bill Bradley is pulling his hat out of the 88 presidential ring even before it was in. The New Jersey Democrat says he's happy with his job and has some serious work to get done. Bradley has been considered a top prospect for the Democratic nomination since emerging as a major figure in the tax reform debate. Actress Shirley MacLaine says she sees things other people swear aren't there. The reason, according to MacLaine, is her psychic power. Asked about the ridicule she gets from non-believers, McLean says, quote, that's their reality. She also says she's going to open a chain of spiritual retreats to help people meditate better. Evangelist Oral Roberts has made a life and death appeal to his followers. He says God told him he is going to die unless millions of dollars are raised in his current fund drive. Peggy Waymeyer reports that even some of his report supporters are skeptical. If we don't do something soon, then God's going to call me home. As and with that, longtime evangelist Oral Roberts launched a 30-minute appeal for donations from the Oral Roberts Medical School. I need to turn it around enough so I'll know when March comes, I won't be taken. I'll get to live.
My life will be extended. Will you help extend my life? What Oral Roberts wants is $8 million to pay the tuition expenses of all the medical students here at Oral Roberts University. He says that way they'll be financially free when they graduate to minister overseas. Roberts says God told him last March he'd only have a year to live if he didn't raise all the money. He's had the guts and the courage to stand up and tell the truth. But this is what God has said to me. Now, Oral Roberts would not grant us an interview, but his son Richard, who's being groomed to succeed him, says if his father dies, he'll put his own life on the line as well. How does God tell somebody something like that? Well, he speaks to people in many different ways. How did uh, he tell him he was going to die in March if he didn't get this money? He spoke to him in his spirit. Uh, many times God speaks through an audible voice. Sometimes he speaks through impressions that you feel inside. Sometimes he speaks through other people and confirms God can speak in any way. God is God. This week, the evangelist urged his viewers and his 4,600 students to give their money to help save his life. Did you give money? Yes, I did. Did you give money? Yes, ma'am, I sure did. And I believe what he says. I definitely believe what he says, and I'm going to stand with him. I totally agree with the whole, I think he hears from God. But some students say they are secretly embarrassed by their president's latest appeal and think he's gone too far. It's very hard to believe that God will deal that way. You know, the God I know is not the God that will take someone's life. If God really wants the med school to be uh, in existence, that he would provide the means without us having to resort to these sorts of uh, um, fundraising tactics. For now, viewers in this area may not hear much about Robert's life and death need, but Robert's hopes to be back in April with some good news. I'm Peggy Waymeyer, Tulsa. The bulls ran wild on Wall Street Thursday, pushing the Dow Jones Industrial Average above the 2,000 mark for the first time in history. The Dow climbed more than eight points to close. It's uh, over, and uh, uh, he pushed off, pushed our player down, caught the pass, and scored the touchdown. You know, to his credit, he made the play, but he made it on a push, and the official... Uh, uh, just blew the call. He did it. I mean, he hit it and he got it down there and they made the catch. And after that, uh, it, uh, anything was possible with Roger Stahl, but he never thought you were ever out again. Sharp Electronics presents the Sharp NFL Sports Fact. In 1985, the Jets scored 62 points against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What team holds the all-time record for points scored in a single game? Back with the answer after this message. Anyone could mistake Sharp's giant picture tube TV for real life. The clarity of Sharp's smaller TVs is now on a 35-inch screen with real stereo sound. Sharp, bigger than life, often more exciting. From Sharp Minds comes Sharp Products. In 1966, the Redskins scored 72 points against the Giants to establish the all-time single-game record. Want a good reason why my antacid is Tums? I'll give you three. One, Tums is effective. It neutralizes one-third more stomach acid than the other leading brand. And that's what I take an antacid for. Two, sodium. I don't want any. And Tums is sodium-free. Three, Tums is rich in calcium. And to me, an extra source of calcium is extra good news. <laughs> Sides over. Uh, Landry may appear outwardly aloof, but no one coaches in the NFL for 27 years or wins with such regularity without an ability to deal with people, uh, to share their moments of laughter and sorrow. Tom Landry has earned success coaching players who were tobacco chewers, angry young men, good old boys, wild extroverts, even impassioned poets. But so seldom does Landry express his feelings publicly that sometimes it's easy to forget that this calculating football genius is also a sensitive man of flesh and blood. The hole in Texas Stadium is not as big as the hole in any theory that attempts to explain Tom Landry, the most perplexing personality in the National Football League. No one has penetrated the gunfighter stare 
the grim face that makes him look like a regional director of the FBI, or a brooding Hamlet? Who is the man under the hat? The man who can do more with one look than with a thousand words. He does with, uh, with a certain look what other coaches have to yell and scream and, and find players about it. And he's got several different looks. He's got one that tells you that he's angry, one that says, okay, you got away with it this time, but don't do it again. His physical reaction would appear to others as more of uh, disgust. Uh, when he sees something and he's angry, he'll usually give you the... Paraphrase Rudyard Kipling. Landry keeps his head when all those about him are losing theirs. His outward emotions are slight and subtle. His body language, a mere whisper compared to other coaches. He's really an emotional man. I mean, he does better with his emotions than a lot of other people. He probably doesn't show him out outwardly like a lot of people like for him to do. But uh, he shows his team how he feels, and that's all that really matters, because his team is his life. The first time a cowboy team saw the inner man revealed came in 1966. Dallas lost a crucial game to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and Landry's stoic mask cracked in the locker room. You know, he just came in, and his heart just opened up, and he cried, and, you know, tears came out, and he got us all in there, and he said, fellas, it's not your fault, it's my fault. And uh, he said, I don't know if I'll be with the Cowboys next year. A tremendously emotional experience for all of us, and that was the turning point, I think, of the Dallas Cowboys. From then on, the Cowboys have been in the playoffs all but one year. No one ever questioned Landry's ability with X's and O's. What they doubted from the beginning was his understanding of flesh and blood. Honky-tonk quarterback Don Meredith was a free spirit who drove Landry to distraction. The hands that wrote North Dallas 40 belonged to Pete Gent. A golden boy named Lance Renzel had deep-rooted emotional problems. Quarterbacking the Cowboys was a humbling experience for Craig Morton. Number 14 arrived in 1965 as a strong-armed All-American. He left 10 years later with his body intact, but his psyche ravaged, overwhelmed by Tom Landry. Well, in the, the early years, I was, I think I was intimidated by him um, because he wanted to make me successful. Nothing I really did was, was right. Um, and when you come out of an atmosphere when you're in college that everything you do is right at that level, and you're an all-American, then you come from all-American to all-nothing, and nothing you do is right. Uh, it kind of put me back in a little shell a little bit. I don't think I was assertive. I don't think that I was the leader that I was capable of being. He demands discipline. I don't care if you have a Heisman Trophy winner coming off campus into his system, if you have a free agent like myself coming off a college campus into his system, uh, he expects the same out of every player. Critics disagree saying Landry employs a double standard. He tolerated the antics of a hot dog named Thomas Hollywood Henderson. The player who tested him the most was a mercurial talent named Dwayne Thomas. Drafted number one in 1970, Thomas was a loner, but a man most experts conceded was the second coming of Jimmy Brown. Number 33 ridiculed Landry, calling him a plastic man, and openly criticized cowboy management. Part of the Dallas system of motivation is through fear. And what I mean by fear is that uh, uh, if you don't do your job, you're not going to be here. You see? So I understood what the premise was. The premise was what? Performance. So if the premise is performance, well, then the pay should be performance. Thomas created a divisive force among both the players and coaches, but he led them to a world championship in 1971. Did Landry coddle Thomas, or was this a sign that he was mellowing, more aware of an individual's needs? 
I think that Tom did use a, uh, a double standard, but I don't think that's a weakness. I think it's a strength, and everybody understood that. Dwayne had some problems that he had to deal with, and, and Coach Landry was willing to, to help deal with them. Well, I had very little patience with people who didn't want to be the best, and I was very demanding. I think I've changed through the years. Uh, I became a Christian uh, a couple of years before I joined the Cowboys as a coach, and this, is, this has made a big difference in my life through the years that I've coached football. Uh, I'm much more tolerant. I enjoy it much more. Uh, I have a, a greater feeling for players now than I've ever had before, and so I think that makes you coach difference and, and feel different, and I think it's good. I think the biggest misconception the public has about Coach Landry is the fact that he's a, not a personable man. Uh, he tells jokes in the meetings. He's very lively, even though no one laughs at his jokes. Well, one, one year, some guys, I think it was Bob Rooney and some more guys, I think maybe even Danny White was involved in it, hired a, a lady to come in and sing happy birthday to him with the old Tinkerbell uniform on, and she got Tom to dance with her and stuff in front of the, in front of the team. And it was, it was real funny. I just, we never thought he'd do it. He just had a great time. Rarely has this glacier melted. It is a side of Tom Landry only his players have witnessed and shared. Roger Starbuck, Landry's most brilliant disciple, led Dallas twice to Super Bowl victories, and when he retired in 1979, gave voice to sentiments long held by Cowboy players. The system uh, was successful before me. It's been successful in the 70s with me, and it'll be successful without me. Of course, the nuts and bolts of the Dallas Cowboys is... Uh, <coughs> A man who wears a funny hat on the sidelines. Tom Landry is a very, very great man. He's a great football coach, maybe the greatest football coach that's ever lived. Everything that he does, he does it the right way. And uh, I think he's a, a person that everybody can look to as really a hero figure. Personally, he has been a guy that has been a role model as far as I'm concerned. I think the way in which he's conducted himself you know, in every facet of, uh, of the National Football League has been something that I've tried to follow. He's a kind of guy you don't want your daughter to marry. Most of his players, when they leave the team, pretty much know how to handle themselves in the uh, other world other than professional football because Coach Landry has trained us so well. Thomas Wade Landry, the man under the hat. When he exits pro football, he will leave a brilliant legacy, both as a coach and as a man. Nestle Crunch presents Crunch Time. Trailing the Redskins 13 to 10, the Vikings went to a familiar combination. Fran Tarkenton to John Gilliam, number 42. The two hooked up for two Viking touchdowns that highlighted the 17-point fourth quarter that propelled the Vikings to a comeback win. Chocolate is scrunches when it crunches. That's why I love Red 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 Crunch. Milk chocolate, mm, so creamy, blending crispies, ooh, so dreamy. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Is it true that a Big Mac attack starts with a craving for two all-beef patties? Oh, boy, does it. Followed by a tendency to repeat yourself? Oh, boy, does it. Does and it. a total loss of concentration? What's that? A total loss of concentration. What's that? An inability to speak clearly. Now the good of that. An urge to share? Mm -hmm. uh, what about the Coke? Mm -hmm. Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's the $1 million High Rollers Tournament. And a pleasant greeting to you. I'm Steve Grad. Welcome to our telecast. We're delighted you're with us today. 
boy, this is a most unique tournament in the sporting world. You've got some great bowlers, but they're not pros. They're like you and I. They're scratch bowlers, to be sure. Call toll-free 1-800- All this guy's going to blow his head. Turn up somebody. When he turned down for a presidential pardon the day before his death, now, Senator Arlen Specter said that he talked with Dwyer on the phone Wednesday, told him a pardon was premature, unrealistic. The next day, Dwyer committed suicide at a news conference. The way in which the media has handled that suicide is the subject of a report now by CNN's Bill Tush. Executives in newsrooms all across the country wrestled with the question of whether or not to present the horror of the videotaped suicide of Pennsylvania State Treasurer R. Bud Dwyer. This was one sad man and a very tragic end to apparently a sad life, a sad chapter in his life. And it served no useful purpose to show in tight close-up that man take his own life. Uh, this was a senseless event. Uh, that uh, did not need, to, we did not need to share that with the public. Local and national news organization switchboards lit up with reactions from the viewers. I think probably 75% of the people said it was good that we didn't show it, and about 25% of them uh, wanted to see it. Newspapers were quick to report the story, and just as quick with criticism See, the way showing. television handled the situation. See, I didn't know. I wasn't paying attention. I thought it was joking. Sure, the Columbia Kill. School of Journalism discussed the ethical Kill. questions such a story raises. Journalists have got to learn that one of the great arts in telling stories is understatement. So if we show the before, the drama of a man beset and possibly uh, placed into a psychotic or traumatic condition and then show the consequence that's enough psychologists point out that there is evidence that reading about or hearing about suicide on radio and tv increases the suicide rate recent episodes of both the equalizer and la law dealt with suicide in a graphic way according to united press international it isn't known if dwyer saw either show only one Pittsburgh station, WPXI, aired the complete tape of the suicide, but that only happened once. After that, the station manager there edited out the most gruesome segments, saying he felt responsible to air it the first time on a breaking story. Apparently, other locals and networks disagreed. Bill Tosh, CNN, New York. Why would he do that? New York Mets pitcher Dwight Gooden was sentenced on Friday on charges stemming from a run-in last December in Tampa, Florida, with the police. The 22-year-old...